good. I think we're ready to start. These people have picnics to go to and fun things and stuff while we're here in church. But anyway, <laughs> good morning. I hope you have a blessed Memorial Day ahead of you. Thank you for spending your holiday weekend here in church. I do appreciate that. And with that, let's open with a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for this group that have come out and spent some of their holiday with us. Lord, as we approach Memorial Day, may we ever be so grateful for those who have given up their lives, those in service who uh, laid down their lives, who sacrificed all so that we could have the freedoms that we enjoy today, the freedom to assemble, the freedom to preach, the freedom to worship God, Lord, without any fear of interference. Lord, our hearts especially go out to the 13 troops that were killed in Afghanistan last August. Lord, may they not be forgotten. And this being the first Memorial Day without them, may their families just treasure them and, and have good memories of them. And may they be very proud of the service they gave to this country. Lord, be with us during this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The first song is To God Be the Glory, page number 363. To God Be the Glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. O oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. O oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. O oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son And give him the glory, great things he hath done Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done And great are rejoicing through Jesus the Son but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. O oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Amen. Thank you for singing out. That was very nice. Our unison reading today comes from the Old Testament and very, maybe a very unfamiliar book to you, the book of Haggai. Please stand if you're able and comfortable as I ask Mrs. Linda Campbell to the pulpit to lead us in this unison reading. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, 
the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai, the prophet, saying, It is time for ye, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie in waste. Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Ye have so much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none more. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Amen. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word, and you may be seated. This morning I'm going to speak on a topic that I rarely do. And I do rarely speak on this topic simply because I don't have to and I don't like to. But I have to speak on it from time to time. And I rarely speak on this topic because praise the Lord I don't have to. And to this I say thank God because today I'm going to speak on financially supporting your church. God has blessed me with a church full of faithful people who give freely to this ministry without being pressured or harassed or guilted. And I am so very glad. I hate talking about money from the pulpit. In saying this now, I'm not putting down other pastors who have to. Some churches may have to mention money often just to meet their weekly budget. They're not, you know, if I were in their shoes, I would probably do the same. Fortunately, currently I am not in their shoes. You know, for over two years now, we don't take up an official uh, ceremonial offertory during our uh, church service because of the pandemic. We just never, we stopped doing that because we were told that the offering plate was full of COVID germs and we don't, you know, that's another sermon. <laughs> so we stopped taking up a, up a formal offering and uh, uh, we just have offering plates sitting about the place now. We never really went back to taking up a formal offering and I don't even point out the offering plates to you people. You good people just come in. You know that you're to give to the Lord as he lays on your heart. And you do so without so much as a mention from me. You faithfully give and I thank God for you. But just because I don't have to preach on the subject of money does not mean that I am relieved from preaching on this subject entirely. Giving to the Lord's work is instructed by the Bible for us Christians to do. And I'm to preach every part of the Bible. So here goes. Our scripture reading today comes from Haggai chapter 1 verses 2 through 7. This is a very simple story with a very simple message. In the time of King Darius around 520 BC, the Lord speaks to the prophet Haggai. And Haggai relays the Lord's message to Zerubbabel the governor and to Joshua the high priest of Jerusalem. Because some years prior, 70 years from that, before this point, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed Solomon's temple when Jerusalem was conquered by the Babylonians. God allowed this to happen because the people of Jerusalem had turned their backs against God and toward false idols one too many times. Babylonia leaves Jerusalem in rubble and the people of Jerusalem were either killed or taken captive. And we talked about this a few months ago when we talked about Daniel and Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. That was the era when Jerusalem was under captivity. But then after the 70-year captivity, Persia rules over Babylon, and the king of Persia allows the Jews to return back to Jerusalem if they so wish. Now think of that, being allowed to return to a city after being vacated 70 years prior. You know, only those 70 years and older, who would that be here? No, don't answer that. <laughs> only those over 70 years old would remember Jerusalem from its glory days. To those under 70 years old, re re relocating to a city in ruins would be no joy. All they know and all they ever knew was back in Babylon. Anyway, so many Jewish people take up uh, Persia's offer and many return and they begin rebuilding Jerusalem. They rebuild their homes. They rebuild their businesses. They rebuild their roads. They rebuild everything. Everything except the temple, the Lord's house, God's house. In time, the city begins shaping up and it comes alive again. The Lord, with this, you would think he'd be glad, but no, he becomes angry. That years have now gone by and the people have not yet rebuilt the temple. 
The people are living in fi finished houses. That's what the word sealed means in our unison reading. The, in other words, they're complete, they're sealed. The people are living in finished houses, yet the temple lies in waste and ruin. Now, the people have their reasons for ignoring the temple. They claim that they cannot rebuild the Lord's house because their own needs are not yet being fully met. After all, they figure, how can they spare the money to rebuild the, the Lord's house when they don't even have enough money to properly clean, clothe and feed themselves? How could they possibly attend to the Lord's shopping list when there are still many items unfulfilled on their own shopping lists? Disgusted, the Lord proclaims to the prophet Haggai, that his people are never satisfied. They're just never satisfied. They have so much. They waste so much. Yet they claim never to have enough. They have plenty of clothes. Yet they complain that they are never warm. They have plenty to drink. Yet they claim they're thirsty. They have plenty to eat. Yet they believe themselves to be hungry. Because they are so selfish and so ungrateful for what they have. And because they allow their selfishness to become an obstacle to rebuilding the Lord's house. The Lord proclaims that it is as if they are putting their money into bags that are full of holes. You get the picture. Symbolically speaking, they put their coins into a bag and they walk around and then unaware, the coins slip out of these holes one by one. You see, the Lord is supplying their needs. God is even supplying their wants. He's even supplying some of their luxuries. But because they are disobedient, their gains are not being blessed or recognized. They have enough, yet they always seem to be a dollar short and a day late. They have, should have plenty, but yet it seems like they can never financially make it to the end of the month. Their curse is this. No matter how much they have, they will never have enough. If they have a fortune, their lifestyles will require a fortune and a half. No matter how much they have, there is always a wolf at their door wanting more. Now the Lord is patient, but even his patience runs out. He has had enough. His house will no longer stand in ruins. The Lord will be glorified. He will be obeyed. And by the way, it isn't merely the condition of the temple that frustrates God so much. God is not that shallow. It's the fact that the people are doing nothing for him. They have no reverence of him. And the temple is an outward example of their inward selfish attitude. The temple lying in ruins is an outward symbol of how the people actually feel inwardly about the things of God. In other words, they don't care. I'll give you an example we can all relate to. Every building has weeds. Your house has weeds. My house has weeds. This church building has weeds. God is not mad at the weeds. God made the weeds. As a church body, if we have no strength, no time, no volunteers, and no resources to pull those weeds, God does not get angry. I don't believe that for a minute. But if our attitude is, I could pull those weeds easily enough at the church house, but I'm not going to because I have no regard for the Lord or his church, then we may provoke God to anger. The amount of work that lies ahead of us does not anger God. What does anger God? Our attitudes about the work that lies ahead. If we give up, throw up our arms and say, let God's house fall down around us, I don't care. If God gets angry, so what, whatever. As long as my roof doesn't leak, who cares about the church's roof? As long as there's food in my cupboards, who cares if my neighbors are hungry? As long as I'm on my way to heaven, who cares about anyone else's souls? I'm okay, I'm good, I don't need to worry about anything else. You know, that's apathetic, to not care about anyone. That's very apathetic. And remember, it's our apathy that makes God the most angry. The Bible tells us that he would rather we be cold or hot, but if we're lukewarm, he will spit us out. Let's get back to our story. So Haggai the prophet relays to the people the Lord's words, which we read in our unison reading, and something almost miraculous happens. God warns Haggai, and Haggai warns the people. The people listen to God... And they finish the temple. Isn't that marvelous? God doesn't have to resort to threats or plagues or destruction. Amen. They just obey. The people hear God's complaint and they say, uh, okay. Now, granted, we find out as we read, their attitude about rebuilding the temple, it's not the best. 
They give the temple only their lackluster attention. The temple hardly reflects God's glory as it did back in the days of King Solomon. So Haggai challenges the people to repent from their lukewarm ways. And he reminds the people that they are to give their best to the master. There are people who it seems never have enough to sustain them. But once they start donating their money, their time, their talents and supplies to the Lord's house, the Lord begins blessing them. But the moral is how much more the Lord would have blessed them if they had been cheerful, generous givers. The lesson is if we give lackluster, we will be blessed lackluster. If we give with exuberance, God will bless us with exuberance. God loves a cheerful giver. The title of my lesson this morning is Holy, Holy, Holy. Now you probably notice they're all spelled differently. Let me take these one at a time. Does it, feel like, does it feel like our pockets are holy? H-O-L-E-Y. Does it feel like no matter how much we earn, we always fall short? You know, people in America have never been paid so much. I saw a sign at IHOP advertising that they're willing to pay up to $20 an hour to work at IHOP. And yet nobody has gas money to get to work. Isn't that amazing? We've never had so much, yet we don't have enough. Could this be because our country has turned its back on the Lord? And the answer is yes. I would rather have $5 blessed of God than $50 that isn't. And by the way, the curse of having holes in our money bags can also apply to churches as well. We're not exempt. When you know of a church who spends money and spends money has nothing to show for it, when a church's funds seem like they're being kept in a bag full of holes, I can almost tell you, almost guarantee what the problem is. The problem is that the, is that the focus of that church has been removed from God's will to a man's wish to build an altar to himself. Do you know of a church that takes in great sums of money, yet they have a reputation of never paying their bills? I can almost guarantee that God is no longer the center of that ministry. I pray that is not our or ever will be our situation. If it is, I'm blind to it. And if it is, I will correct that. When God is the center of our lives, all our needs are cared for. So how do we fix this? Well, it's easy. How do we close up the holes in our money bags? We fix it by loving him and serving him completely or wholly. W-H-O-L-L-Y. The holes in our pockets will close up. The Lord will bless us all the more. The feeling of a lack of blessings will disappear. And we, when we wholly embrace him, the solution is so easy. If we're, you know, we're in a financial crisis right now in this country. And if our country, if, from our, if our dear country, from the president up down to the common man, would first ask themselves, what would God have me do? America would set itself aright. Amen, amen, amen. Yeah, amen. You're right. America needs to move God and the things of God to the top of their priority list. Then and only then will we see a difference. And then comes the third holy, H-O-L-Y. The Lord is holy. We need to strive to be more like him, holy, separate from the wickedness of this world. Everything we have is because of him. So it is really so little a task to give, him, to give some of it back to him. And he will bless us for it. You say, Pastor, just cut to the chase. You want us to give more money to the church. Well, that would be nice. <laughs> I won't lie from the pulpit, that would be nice. But that is not my objective. My main objective is not to, give you, to get you more money out of you or to give you to give more money to the church. My main objective is to get more blessings for you. I'll leave you with the words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 9. He says this, pay attention. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. Now.
Let's turn to page number 690, America the Beautiful, in honor of uh, Memorial Day, number 690. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountains, majesty above the fruited plain. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Oh, beautiful for pilgrim feet who stirred in passion stress, a thoroughfare for freedom beat across the wilderness. America, America, God mend thine every flaw. Confirm thy soul in self-control, the liberty in love. All oh, beautiful for heroes prove in liberating strife. Who more than self their country love and mercy more than life. America, America, may God thy gold refine till all success be nobleness and every gain divine. Oh, beautiful for patriot dream that sees beyond the years. Thine alabaster cities gleam undimmed but human tears. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Amen. Our responsive reading today is a short one that comes to us from the end of John, chapter 21. Please stand if you're comfortable and able to stand as I invite Mrs. Amanda Rockar to the pulpit to lead us in this reading. This is the disciple which testifieth of these things. And wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did. The which, if they should be written, every one. I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Amanda. <laughs> I was asked uh, a couple weeks ago to preach on this. Uh, subject I'm going to get to you to in a minute and I have to warn you that this sermon may leave you with more questions than it does answers but that can't be helped I'd like to when somebody asks me to preach on something I do try to do that uh, but when I present these things you'll just have to think about these things on your own study them out pray about them and draw your own conclusions with God's guidance of course when we read our Bibles especially our New Testament we quickly realize that there is something called the Trinity the Trinity is both simple and yet very complex. Simply put, the Trinity means that we serve only one God, yet that one singular God is somehow divided into three distinct personalities, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Some liken the Trinity to an egg. Just like our one God, one egg has three parts, the yolk, the white, and the shell. Some liken the Trinity to water, just like our God, one substance water, can appear as a liquid, as it does in this cup, or as a gas, as you boil it, it becomes steam, or as a solid ice, as you freeze the water. See, this, the Trinity is simple. 
Yet the Trinity is very complex. So complex that, if I may be so bold, no one being no human being on this side of heaven has ever been able to properly grasp it or to properly, properly explain it. What do we know about the Trinity? Well, we know that the three members of the Trinity are each God. It says so in their names. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. This makes all three members eternal, everlasting. The three members are always of the same mind. They don't argue with each other. They have the same purpose and the same agenda. The three are each omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. If you don't know what that means, that means all-knowing, everywhere, and all-powerful. Each one glorifies the other two because they are, they are the other two. They are or one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. These three are one. Now, we're going to save the third person of the Trinity for next week. That's the Holy Spirit because next week's sermon we're going to talk about the day of Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit is the star. He's the main subject of that sermon. So this morning, I would like to just talk about God the Father and God the Son, or more precisely, and this is where the question that was asked to me two weeks ago, more precisely, the relationship between these two. Now, no true believer would disbelieve or dismiss that these two, God the Father and God the Son, are in tune with each other and that when they both reside in heaven. Jesus, we're told, sits on the right hand of the Father, and he and the Father are in step, they're in sync, and they are in tune. The Son would never be in a disagreement with the Father, nor the Father with the Son. What one knows, the other knows. They are a team. But that's heaven. The question was, and the question remains, what was their dynamic when the Son of God left his Father behind in heaven to live upon this earth for 33 years, about 2,000 years ago? What was their connection like then? Did their relationship change when the son took on the form of a man called Jesus? Did the son still continually know the mind of God the Father? And that's a great question. I don't know that I can answer it, but I'm going to try. In the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus tells us that he and the Father are one. So by Jesus' own confession, even though Jesus is temporarily tethered to this earth, Jesus says that he and the Father are still in one accord. Amen. So we, we have a good place to jump off from. In fact, we are told that the only time when the two are out of accord, when they're not in accord, is when Jesus is dying on the cross. He calls out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And we believe Jesus does so because the sins of the world had been laid upon him at that moment. God cannot abide in sin or with sin. Our sins separated Jesus Christ from God the Father. The communion between Father and Son was broken. Other than that one time, it's plain to see as we read the Gospels that God the Son in the form of a man still has a very special, very accurate connection with God the Father that we mere mortal sinners just do not possess. Even though the two of them are separated by a galaxy, heaven, earth, even though one is, is dressed in mortal flesh, there is still co an, a connection, a communion between them between the time the, uh, during the time the Son is earthbound. And I don't believe that any Bible-believing person could or would argue against that point. They have a very special connection. But the question remains, and the question that was actually said to me, asked of me, is how intense, how solid, how direct was their connection when the Son walked on this earth? And I've come up with three possible answers to that question. Now, to explore these three answers, I'm going to use the analogy of wiring an electric light to make my point. And my apologies to any electricians out there, because I'm really quite stupid. <laughs> I, I don't know how to wire a light. Anyway, but here's the first. When Jesus Christ was on this earth, was his connection wired directly into the father's breaker box or, or fuse box? Or was his connection to the father on an on-off switch? Or was his connection to the father on a dimmer switch? What do I mean by this? Well, let's take these one at a time. Could we compare the spiritual or mental connection between God the father and God the son to a light wired directly into a breaker box? In other words, was Jesus always on? Was he always a conduit for the 
God the Father? Was Jesus a constant conduit to, God, to God's will? When Jesus spoke, was it really God the Father's words flowing through him with no variation or room for interpretation? Did Jesus not speak without any sort of, lit, uh, not list, but with, uh, with any stutter, with any stammer? Was he just on? Did the Son know everything that the Father knew at all times? In other words, there's no way to turn off Jesus from his connection, turn off the connection between Jesus and God the Father. When Jesus spoke to the multitudes, when he's speaking to the crowds, was he simultaneously aware of an earthquake happening on another continent? When Jesus spoke to his disciples, was he aware of a sparrow who fell from her nest hundreds of miles away? When experiencing daily life here on earth, was Jesus also aware of what all was happening in heaven? While in human form was the Christ aware of everything God the Father was aware of, God the Father, we just described as omniscient, all-knowing, was Jesus also all-knowing 24-7. I want to believe that. I really do. In fact, I, I tend to believe this. But this idea is complicated by the fact that Jesus Christ lived on this earth in various stages. First, he was a fetus in Mary's womb. Second, he was a newborn baby. Then he was a small child. Then he was a pre-crucified man. And lastly, he was a post-resurrected man. Perhaps the son's electrical relationship with God the Father was different during each of these stages. Because it's hard to believe, it's hard to picture that Jesus as a fetus or as a newborn baby could properly preach the Father's will and perform miracles. And if he could so as a baby, if the baby could, uh, could, could, could preach the Lord's will, why didn't he? I mean, that's quite a party trick, a newborn baby who could preach the Sermon on the Mount. See, it's hard to imagine that, isn't it? It's almost silly to imagine that. It's easier to believe that the newborn Son of God was dealing with the same limitations as every other baby ever born. So moving on, if Jesus wasn't directly wired into God's fuse box, perhaps Jesus' spiritual and mental connection to the Father was more of an on-off switch um, uh, situation. For instance, obviously when Jesus prayed, his thoughts were one with God the Father. But when Jesus slept, and we're told he slept, even though we're told God the Father never sleeps, when Jesus slept, was that communication switched off? So that Jesus the man could get some mental rest is all we humans need. And if the son's connection with the father was on an on-off switch, which of the two had control of the switch? Could Jesus Christ turn off the father as he wanted to? Or did the father possess complete control of the on-off switch? Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. In Luke 11, Jesus announces to his disciples that his friend Lazarus died. Even though he is miles away, and no one has reported this fact to Jesus, Jesus just somehow knows Lazarus is dead. We correctly assume that God the Father has relayed this information to his son. Amen. Yet in Matthew 14, Jesus seemingly has no knowledge that John the Baptist is dead. Jesus is told by John the Baptist's disciples, and supposedly not by God the Father, that John was beheaded, and Jesus does not take this well. Can we assume that this horrific news takes Jesus by surprise? Why didn't he have, he had foreknowledge of uh, Lazarus' dead, but no death, but no knowledge of John the Baptist's death? This is one example of what I mean by an on-off switch. The switch was apparently on concerning Lazarus' death, yet apparently off concerning John the Baptist's death. Or so I interpret. Maybe I'm reading it wrong. Or third, would we better describe the connection between the Father and the Son as more of a dimmer switch arrangement? A dimmer switch that isn't fully on, but it's not turned off either. In other words, was Jesus given a general idea of God's agenda, but yet he could not see clearly the details of the future? Did Jesus know the Father's whole itinerary from the start, or did the Father just funnel the information to the Son as on a need-to-know need basis? I'll give you an example. After the last supper hours before the crucifixion, Jesus and a handful of his disciples go to the Garden of Gethsemane. He tells his disciples to watch and pray. And it's as if Jesus knows that the men are coming for him with John, with Judas Iscariot. They're coming to arrest him. But it's also kind of clear that Jesus doesn't know when this is going to happen. So he advises his disciples to stand watch and wait for this to happen. 
It's like Jesus knows something's going to happen, but he doesn't have the details. Again, maybe I'm misinterpreting that passage. And speaking of the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus reveals in his prayer that he, he acknowledges, the, acknowledges the cup before him, that he is going to die for the sins of the world, but then he asks that the cup be passed from him. This gives us more substantiation that the Father and he are on a dimmer switch. That's not to say that they're not on the same page. It's just that maybe God wrote the words on the page and Jesus is still catching up to those words. Jesus knows what is to take place, his death, yet if possible, he asks that that not happen. The dimmer switch idea that Jesus knows some things but not, not all things is further evidenced by Jesus' own words. In Matthew 24, 36, Jesus is talking about the end times and he says, but of that day and hour knoweth no man no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Jesus is confessing that he doesn't, doesn't even know when the end times are going to happen. He confesses that only God, the Father, knows that information. So which is it? Is the connection between God, the Father, hardwired? Is it on an on-off switch? Or is it on a dimmer switch? I don't know. Why are you asking me this question? I have no idea. <laughs> How would I describe this relationship between the Father and his earthbound son? I can't. I just tried and I can't. I can't do it justice. I did warn you that this sermon may leave you with more questions than answers. But this is what I do know. However it was or however it wasn't, one thing is clear. Jesus was the Son of God incarnate who was in tune with God the Father. They were part of the Trinity. These three were one. At least in this sermon, these two were one. God the Father said it best when he said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. That should be enough for us. Because we don't know. We have questions. This is a mystery to us. And with all mysteries, we may not know here on this earth. We may not figure it out. We may guess correctly. But we'll never know that we're correct until we get to heaven. And I believe in heaven all this will be revealed to us. All we need to know is Jesus Christ was indeed the Son of God incarnate in the flesh. And his, his sacrifice is what saves us from our sins. Although it's hard to imagine, yet hard to describe, the Father and the Son had a connection that we mere mortal sinners do not have with God. That's the beauty of the Trinity. That's its uniqueness. That's its mystery. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, these three are one. Now next week we'll talk about the Holy Spirit. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for this time together. I do thank you for these good people who have come to spend some of their Memorial Day weekend with us. And Lord, may we again be truly thankful for those who have sacrificed so that we could assemble here, we could worship here, we could preach here without fear of uh, uh, interrogation, without fear of interruption, Lord. We're so grateful for that. And Lord, these mysteries all that we talk about in the Bible, although they're fun, uh, we know that one day we will know the truth. When we get to heaven, all will be revealed and all will have answers to all our questions. And Lord, I personally can't wait for that day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please take your hymnals and turn to number 56. God will take care of you. Number 56. And please stand. Be not dismayed, what day be tied, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. Dear Heavenly Father, as we leave this place, may you see us safely to our next destinations. May have, we have a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. Uh, and may we give credit to those who fell so that we could have such a wonderful day. Lord, may you give us blessings and opportunities to serve you in the week ahead. Until we meet again, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And thank you for coming. You are dismissed.